Just hit the button, man. <laughs> Give it. Crap. Give it 10 seconds. Ah, perfect. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. I'm going to do a talk about. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's too close. I want to do a talk about debugging PowerShell. Um, I've been working with PowerShell for over eight years now, uh, and that's been pretty hardcore work um, where I, I redirected my, my career over PowerShell. Uh, I used to do software development, uh, just doing standard C++ and C Sharp, and then I switched into doing PowerShell. And so through all that time, I spent an obnoxious amount of time writing and debugging scripts and helping others figure out how to do that and how to deal with the scary red error text. And uh, so I wanted to give a presentation here about that, just to kind of show you um, some of the things that I've done, some of the things I've learned, some tools I've made that help this work out uh, a little bit more easily that you guys can use, and um, hopefully bring your debugging experience up to the next level. Um, my name's Kirk Monroe. I go by the nickname Poshaholic. Uh, that's the name I grabbed more than eight years ago now when I first started doing PowerShell and realized how much I liked it. Um, I used to write MAPI and LDAP code, and so I was the protocol guy working on a, an Exchange product that had a lot of work with Exchange and Active Directory, and if you've ever worked with some various uh, complicated APIs like MAPI, and then you move into the world of PowerShell where there is uh, consistency built in as a feature from the get-go, all of a sudden it looks like a, a much uh, brighter sky. So that was uh, one of the big drivers behind me making the switch. I could make intelligent guesses and then do things right, and so I became addicted quickly and then, then started calling myself Poshaholic. A um, bit more background about me. So, uh, how many people recognize this image? So, um, this, is the power, this is the Power GUI uh, logo, but done my son style. Um, so, I used to be the, uh, well, I used to work as an architect and then later on as a product manager on the Power GUI team, also doing evangelist work. Um, did that for about five years, give or take. After that, I switched to working on this product, which may also be familiar with people in the room, PowerWF. Uh, it was the first tool out there that gave you a uh, way to transition between a visual workflow designer and a PowerShell uh, script on the back end. Plus, it had a lot of cool stuff with, with uh, System Center tied in. Um, so, all that was work focused on PowerShell. And then, uh, most recently, I found myself working at a company called Provence, um, something with the letter P with all of these things. But anyway, um, so Provence is a company that does uh, IT asset management, and they hired me for my PowerShell skills because they didn't have anybody internally, and so I still do a lot of PowerShell uh, in Provence today. What I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about a collection of modules or tools that are going to make debugging and defensive scripting easier, and these are, are targeted for, well, the stuff I'm going to go through is targeted on PowerShell 3.0 and later. I know some people are still doing PowerShell 2, and uh, when I really have to, I can get back into that level, but just due to the limited time that I have, and because I don't have my own QA person working with me on these things, I dropped two a little while back, and now I do everything with version three or later. Um, and I'm going to go over as well tips, recommendations, and best practices that uh, you can follow when you're doing uh, debugging, and that can help make it easier to uh, go through and work at problems in your own scripts. So most of this is going to be demo. Um, I'm just going to go through quickly the other slides after this demo because uh, yesterday when I was doing a talk after doing the demo, I forgot to switch back to the slides and didn't show people the context. So um, I'm going to talk about a number of resources here. This slide will give you links to those resources. You can grab them from GitHub or you can grab them from uh, using uh, PowerShell Get uh, and just using install module. And uh, these are a bunch of modules that I create amongst many others that I work on that are uh, have certain features that help with debugging. And then um, contact information for me is on this last slide, uh, my website, my email. Uh, I always tell people when I come to conferences, if you have questions and you want to, uh, you don't know who to ask or you, you'd like to ask me the question but you're a little hesitant, don't hesitate. Feel free to send me the email. I'll respond to it. I don't mind taking one-on-one -on -one emails. People don't usually take me up on that, but those who have, I've been built great relationships with. And, and so it's been beneficial to me because I learn problems that they have and they learn solutions to those problems. And so please uh, use my email address or contact me on Twitter or whatever uh, and I'm happy to help. Oh, and also another way to reach me if you want more immediate feedback these days is uh, there's a PowerShell channel on Slack. And so Slack is uh, almost like a new 
version, well, uh, Revolution Beyond uh, IRC. And so I hang out on that a lot. So if you go to powershell.slack.com, you can sign up or you can go in through the IRC because they're both connected. And I hang out there. So if you want to come find me um, uh, with shorter notice, that email, you can often find me hanging around, hanging around that chat room. So now let me go into doing some uh, content demonstration. So one of the funniest pain points about uh, debugging and, and error handling PowerShell is the notion of red error text. Now, when my son was just a little boy and uh, small enough that I could carry him in a carrier when I was walking around the store, he used to be deathly afraid of Barney the Dinosaur. I don't know why, but Barney the Dinosaur, mortal, peer, mortal fear for him. He would uh, freeze on the spot. I would notice, I'd be walking around a toy store, and all of a sudden he'd stop moving. And then he'd start whimpering a little bit and going uh, as, as he was going to cry, and it was because of this terrifying fear. And I feel that, like for some people, uh, red error text is the same thing. So I'll get somebody who sends me an email, or somebody calls me over the desk, and I had, they had a program or a script that I gave them, and they say, there's a problem. And so I say, okay, well, what happened? And they say, it's red. And that's typically how the, the conversation starts. And so I go over to the desk and I look at the problem. And there's actually a lot of detailed information behind that problem that can help them figure it out. So I'm just going to run a, a helpful uh, helper function here and then show uh, just an example of red error text. So, so people get stuck on this red error text. And there's a bunch of ways you can make it less scary. You can change the color if, if uh, that helps. And actually, that does help. It's a small detail. But for some people, just by changing it from red to something else, they start paying more attention to it. So um, I'll change the color to cerulean and then show that same error text. And that's not a great back color on this, uh, on this background. So I can do another one and then show the same error text. So, so people, I know numerous people. And actually, this is something I saw Don Jones present about a while back, um, talking about changing the color. People change the color and it makes a difference. It pops the text out more, they pay more attention to it. The red sometimes just doesn't do it for people. Um, another thing that you can do, and this one's a little less known, um, there are different views for errors. So there's normal view, which is what you see inside my console. There's also a category view. And if you change the uh, error view, which is a parameter built in PowerShell by default, to category view, then when you show an error, you, you get different information presented. Oops. It's the same information, just um, in a more terse format. So in this case, it's showing the error, object not found, uh, with uh, which, what, was, what wasn't found, what, some of the information about the uh, type of variables that are being used, what command wasn't called, uh, and the actual exception that was used. And so some people like this format better because one of the intimidating factors about this is the fact that it shows code. And if you're dealing with non-PowerShell scripters, just this bottom portion here, the, the, from, from about the line number, um, on tends to intimidate them. Or even starting with the name of a command because they're not necessarily not thinking about commands. They're thinking about tools and utilities and want to get stuff done. And so these details get a little lost at a glance between the red error text and, and all the other information. And so sometimes just switching the view can help. Um, there should be more views. And a long time ago, I had a, a module that uh, defined a couple of additional views. However, um, one day I found myself installing some stuff in my system and I was running out of hard drive space and so I was quickly deleting some things and then I realized while I'm holding down shift delete on my keyboard that my modules folder is selected. And so not in a bit of panic, not sure what to do. I was running out of disk space because I was installing Visual Studio. I ended up letting go of the keys, deleting my modules folder, tried to recover it but I couldn't because the fat table was overwritten and that's why people should use source control. <sighs> so. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to get back to pull it. The, out of all the modules I lost, there was only one that I really cared about that I lost, and that was the one that was defining some additional views. So I'm going to get back to building that and, uh, and put that out there as a module for community members to, to work with. But for now, uh, you get two out of the box, and there may be some other utilities out, out there that give you more, but that, that's pretty much it. Now, um, I also feel that uh, going back to the red error text and, and people kind of getting stuck on the fact that it's red, uh, there should almost be a uh, an, equ an equivalent to let me Google that for you, but for error text, let me read that for you, because the error text does, most of the time, contain useful information that can help you figure out what's going on. Sometimes it doesn't. And so when it doesn't, the details are really, uh, really useful. 
So all errors, you guys probably know this stuff, some of this is pretty basic. So all errors are stored in the error variable. And so you can run error and get a list of all the errors that happened. When that error variable contains a lot of stuff, and especially when you um, are not dealing with this compact view, because this is nice and easy to read, but I'm going to switch back to the default view. So reset uh, default. Oops. So now if I go through and I look at the error context, um, it runs by a lot more quickly and can get spammy and it's harder to find stuff. That's there you see part of the importance of views. But there's other things you can do besides views to, to make error uh, more useful to you. You can group it without any uh, parameters and so it'll group by the uh, string representation of it and then sort it and add counts. And what that does is gives you a view like this, which is really, really useful because, let me change this to uh, maximize view. Whoops, and control. There. So what this view gives you is uh, not only what the errors were, yes, they're cut off, but that's fine, it gives you an idea, but it gives you the counts, and I've sorted it in descending order. So when I'm working through problems and I've created a lot of uh, code inside of a script and I run it, and then I get a whole bunch of errors, I use this, because it'll prioritize for me what's going on. If I get a whole lot of certain error, I'll fix that one first. Or sometimes I'll look at them in order, because order is important for errors too. But this still, I find that given the context of how many times something happened, gives me an idea of, of priorities in terms of, of fixing things. Now, let me switch back to the split view. Um, also, error details are really useful. So you can uh, use format list star, except sort of. When you run dollars on error and you index into it to get an error and you pipe the format list star, you just get the same text that you get when you run it without format list star. That's due to some interesting, interesting nuances with the formatting layer. And so you need to use the force if you really want to get at the actual error details, because it's an object like all objects in PowerShell. And so when you pipe it to format list star, dash force, then you can see details about the exception. You can see uh, other information about the actual target object that was involved. And just, this is useful, to, useful information when you're trying to troubleshoot some of those harder errors. There's a stack trace for the script that was run. Um, so all this stuff is really, really handy. And um, the problem, though, is people often forget to do this dash force thing. Or you get tired of it because it's kind of annoying to check type dash force all the time. So I've got a module out there called format px. And um, among some other really cool things it does, it makes it so you don't have to force things so much. So once it's loaded, it's smart enough to realize that you asked for format list, so I'm going to give you format list. You don't have to force me to do it. You told me you wanted to do it. That's what I'm going to do. Um, it does some other really cool stuff. Um, just an aside, this is a common pain point for people. Uh, get service. OK, star, do a nice short list. So there's a short list of services. And I want to say that, I want to see that in format list format. Uh, so there's format list. And now I want to do something. Let's say I want to stop those services. You know that you can't do this in PowerShell by, by default because PowerShell doesn't support it. But format PX makes that happen. So format PX fixes some of the problems that are in the formatting layer and allows you to do some cool things like piping beyond formatting and, and other stuff. Uh, so I encourage you to give that a look if you want to, if you want to see, see how that works. Now, uh, back to error handling. So when you get into the details, I showed you the full object here. Uh, so I can show format list star. And there is a dot exception property. And dot exception is particularly important because um, sometimes the error text that's at the top, that's at the top level that it shows you inside of the UI by default, doesn't give you the actual error that happened. And so it's a little bit obtuse and obscure to try to figure out what actually went wrong. And so when, if you see an error, and it's not clear to you what's going on, then go look at the exception. Uh, whoops, wait now. Okay, let's try this again. I just hit a, a screenshot there. So, um, so if you go look at the exception, again, it just gives you some text back because of those details about the formatting layer, but you can pipe it to format list and uh, use force if you, if you don't use format px, or don't bother if you use format px, and all of a sudden you're going to get back um, details about the exception. And some of those details are stack trace details, and sometimes there are nested exceptions. So in this case, there's not. Inner exception is null. But you may have to go several levels deep when you're really troubleshooting something and trying to figure out what's going on. So I often find myself looking at um, error.exception.innerexception dot dot inner exception to see what really happened, and that helps me figure out where the real error is. More than one occasion, um, 
there's just, I, I don't have a specific example in front of me right now, where the error is hidden inside of the inner exception part, and that's what tells you um, what actually happened, and then all of a sudden it's easy to fix. When you're dealing with this error collection and errors as they come through, I encourage you to clean up as you handle these errors and make them go away because you don't want to keep your error variable around long. If you do, it makes this get uh, this kind of command up here get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you want to get you're, you're working with the current errors that you're dealing with. So you can remove errors as you deal with them directly, uh, just by removing the actual objects, or you can remove by index. You can remove by range, so you can starting index and how many do you want to remove, or you can clear the whole thing, which will just get rid of the um, get rid of the errors and the error collection, and so that when you go to look at errors again next time after your next run, all of a sudden it's a, a cleaner slate. Questions so far? No, good. So um, another useful thing when you're dealing with errors is is history, but history out of the box has some limited uh, usefulness to it, so. If I run get history, or just h for short, I get back a list of the commands that I ran and, uh, and what those command lines were. And that by itself isn't that useful, but if I um, use a module called history px, so I'll run that, import that module. Now when I get history, I get back, let me show this full screen so you get a better view. Um, and there, page up. So now I get back a more detailed histor historical view of my information. So I'm showing the uh, ID and command line like you were getting before. I see how long my, com my commands took. So if I'm trying things over time and I realize that performance is going downhill all of a sudden from a command I've run numerous times, it allows me to play with that and see what's going on as I'm debugging and, and building up my commands um, for my modules. Uh, I can see whether it was success successful or not in the success column. And I can also see were there any errors, if there were any errors, how many there were, and what was output by the command. Now that's empty right now because you have to prime the pump. I can't all of a sudden just light this up and get this historical information when I didn't capture it. So his history PX injects itself into the pipeline and captures information about what's going on from the point that you load it onwards. So if I flip back to my uh, command line here, and I'm just gonna run a few commands here to generate some errors. So let's get a uh, divide by zero error and uh, service doesn't exist. The details behind these errors are not important. I'm just trying to prime the pump and uh, invoke something that doesn't exist. So now that I've run these three commands and I have some interesting error information, now if I look at history again, all of a sudden I see, okay, there were no errors for the first one, but there was an error for the second, third, and fourth. And so, and also details about what was output. Uh, true or false indicates whether or not they succeeded. So, so that's useful. But um, it's, it's missing an important detail. Um, yeah, I'll do these in the opposite order. So the important detail is that normally dividing by zero is a terminating error. Terminating errors in PowerShell are a bit of a challenge because normally when you run a command, if it's a terminating error, if you don't have it wrapped in a try-catch block, PowerShell treats it just like an ordinary error and then moves on to the next command. I find that very limiting and frustrating, and so in terms of best practices for myself, and defensive scripting, I try catch stuff because it makes terminating errors actually be terminating so that the script stops at that point so I don't get some other weird stuff going on by the script continuing to run. And I'll show you that uh, just as a quick example here and I'll get back to it shortly. So if I run this command, there I just ran that same command that I ran earlier, the try catch one divided by zero, and I caught it and I threw the exception. Now, when I look at history, I see that it failed I see that there was one error, and I see that exclamation mark next to it. That little exclamation mark in the output of uh, history after you load history px indicates that the error that it hit was terminating. And so it's very useful to know what's terminating versus what's not, and this enables you to do that. Normally, you can't tell um, what's terminating, what's not terminating, and this brings that up and, and shines light on it so you can figure out, oh, it didn't even run the rest of my stuff, so I'm not debugging the full script because I hit this terminating error and it was a dead stop. Um, the other important thing about uh, try-catch, I may be getting ahead of myself here, but um, the reason why it's important to use try-catch very liberally in your code is that if you don't, somebody else will. If you create functions and you don't use try-catch in those functions and um, there is a terminating error in that function, 
it's going to run beyond the terminating error and do things which may not be what you want it to do depending on the flow of the function. Somebody else might run that function inside of a try catch block and hit a terminating error and see different behavior. And then you're going to be saying, well, what's going on? And so I just find to make the behavior consistent, use try catch everywhere because somebody else might and it changes the behavior of your own code. And that's a dangerous uh, proposition when you're, when you're scripting and sharing it with other people. Um, a sidebar about the, the history stuff, it's like having a bit of a virtual assistant. You saw Lee Holmes talking about dollar sign underbar underbar the other day. So this does the same thing. So if I run uh, get service here, there's a lot of service information. Let's say that was a call across the network that took a while to go get the stuff and I forgot to store it in a variable and I really don't want to run it again. I don't have to worry about it because I captured it automatically. And not only did they capture it automatically, but it's a bit of a smarter virtual assistant than just, uh, just using um, the magic that Lee was using. So if I switch back to um, this view, I can do some, actually let me go to split view, easier. So once I've got this, it's more like having a virtual assistant. It knows or tries to know when you want it to update itself. So instead of, um, if I run this dollar sign underbar dot name, there I get the names of those services. But did I actually then overwrite my dollar sign underbar underbar variable with those names? No, it stored it because it realizes I'm just using properties. And I can do indexing on that as well. Yes? That's history px. Yeah, history px adds that to PowerShell. Um, yeah, so I can go in and I can do indexing on things. I can stop in the middle and figure out, well, wait a minute, I don't quite know what's going on. I need some help. And so I can go and get some help information. Yet, I still, help information is not really something I want to store in dollar sign underbar underbar. And my assistant knows that, and so it doesn't. And so I still go back and it's holding on to that collection. So it allows me to make some smart choices. And it, or it kind of handles it for me, watching over my back and uh, making sure it's doing the right thing. Um, which is also very useful when you're debugging because just running things iteratively over time, being able to access this stuff and have the assistant is quite handy. Now, um, let's talk about breakpoints because you can't do debugging without breakpoints. So inside of a tool like ISE, you've got visual breakpoints. So I'll set one here on this line and I can run it. Actually, I'll set it on the next line, a little more useful. So I can now run this command. And so I've stopped on my breakpoint and at that breakpoint, I can do some interesting things. And so when you're debugging, you need to do one of a couple of things. You want to stop at a breakpoint, and you want to check, well, what's going on at this point? So I can obviously come over here, and I can check the status of variables. So I can look at dollar sign $s to see what it stores. And there's the, the Windows Update service that it stores, which is currently stopped, so I don't need what if, but whatever. Um, and so there's other things you can do, too, beyond checking variables and running commands. There's a bunch of commands that are built into the debugger in PowerShell. So if I hit L, it gives me a look around, where am I? And so here I see scope about the current position, which inside of ISE, I can just look over at my script. But inside of anything else, if I'm using the native console, if I'm doing remote debugging, and I might not have ISE hooked up, if I'm using uh, other tools, Con EMU, some, some other cool tools that are out there that people use, this lets you look around and see when you're at a breakpoint, what's going on. And so the star here tells me what line I'm on, and then I can see the line numbers that match up with the actual file that I'm in. So that's really useful. Another thing that's useful, is your call stack. So you're going to deal with commands where you go through calling one command into another. So you can just invoke K and that gives you the call stack information for your current, um, at, at the current breakpoint that you're working in. So this is quite useful when you have scripts that call other scripts that call other scripts and so on. And if you want to see what commands are available, there's a whole list of them. You can hit H or question mark and uh, that'll show you the list of all these tools. So there's L for list. K for get PS call stack, they're, they're just like aliases, but these aliases only exist in the debugger scope, not in, uh, not outside in a regular PowerShell. Um, and then there's stepping. And so when you want to step through a script, you're going to want to uh, either, um, you can use the menu items, so I can go into debug, and I can use uh, step over, into, or out, but menu items are slow, and we're all about command line and keys, and so use the shortcuts, learn and use the shortcuts. If I wanted to step over, this step over this command, that means run it and go to the next command in the same scope where I am right now, I would hit F10. If this was a function and I wanted to step into the function, I could hit F11 and it'll bring me inside the function and let me do continue my debugging there and see what's going on. Or if I'm inside of a function, whoops, if I'm inside of a function and I want to step back out because I've stepped in and realized, no, this isn't helpful, get me out and I'll continue from there, 
at any point inside of a function, I can use shift F11 and it'll pull me up one level to the calling scope and I can continue my debugging from there. So play around with these, learn them if you haven't already. Um, it's actually a quick show of hands. How many people do use debugging and stepping and everything already in the room? Great. So I go to some conferences and I see like two hands in the room. And it's, uh, I guess, just different grounds for different things, but uh, not surprising to see a lot of people are already doing this. And for those who aren't, I encourage you to do it because it's uh, just necessary skills to figure this stuff out. And by the way, um, you can see here S for step into, V for step over, and O for step out. So those are the equivalents if you're in the native console doing debugging. Uh, you could just use these shortcuts to step around and do things without the ISE helping you. Um, which I find quite handy because I find the ISE is a little bit uh, slow for the day-to-day -day use that I do. So I do all my work typically inside of a native console um, and then just use those keys uh, for doing debugging. Now, I'm just going to stop the execution here. Uh, stop the debugger. So, um, because I work in the native console, I mean, ISE, here you saw I hit a breakpoint, right? So I can hit F9, turn that breakpoint on or off. That's very handy. But then I don't get that for free if I'm working outside of ISE. If I'm using Notepad++, if I'm using Sublime, if I'm using Con EMU in a native console, I don't get that visual context to do that. And so what, do I, what can I do to, to, to fix that problem? And so I created a module called debugpx. So I'll import that. And uh, I've got a breakpoint command here. I don't have to hit F9 in this guy. I can just run. And it stops on my breakpoint for me automatically. And so that's really cool because it gives me a visual cue where my breakpoints are in this session. If I'm working on debugging problems that's over multiple days, as often I am, because I'm working through some complicated stuff, and I save this file, my breakpoints are still there when I come back the next day. So I don't have to figure out again, what was I debugging, set my breakpoints up, continue doing what I'm doing. I've got the visual cue, it's there. This stuff works when I run stuff in the native console, it stops at the breakpoint, at which point I have those same commands that you see at the top of my window here, uh, SVO for stepping uh, and whatnot, so I can do my debugging uh, and, and figure out what's going on. And you can use uh, BP for short, so I'll hit F5 here to continue, and it stops on BP as well. Both of those two are aliases for a command called enter-debugger. Now, this module is for PowerShell version 3.0 and later. Um, I know that there's some improvements coming. You saw the, you may have seen the demo before lunch that Paul gave talking about uh, some debugging improvements and wait debugger that's in PowerShell version 5 and later. Um, this command will work for PowerShell version 5 as well as PowerShell version 3 up. And it gives you some things that you don't get inside of uh, the uh, wait debugger command, which I find are quite useful. Um, if wait debugger catches up to this and has these features, then I'll just uh, make this not work, not load, not, not be useful essentially in 5.0. So at that point, I can deprecate it uh, for that environment. But uh, for now, it's very handy because I'll be in the world of, worlds of PowerShell version 3 and 4 for quite a while. So, um, so what it does above and beyond what, um, I mean, I don't go into debugging jobs or anything like that, or debugging remote sessions. I do go into, though, doing some interesting things like breakpointing in the middle of a pipeline. So if I hit F5 again, so I've gone and retrieved all services, but I stopped at a breakpoint because uh, I've got the breakpoint command just injected in my pipeline, and it's, uh, so I want to see what's going on. I can do dollar sign underbar, current variable, and I can see what actually stopped on. So it allows me to actually go through and figure out what's my pipeline doing at a certain point. And that by itself is not that useful. But when I get into the next command, actually, I'm going to stop the debugging this one because uh, I don't want to go through hitting continue again and again and again. Oh, did that not work? OK, I'm going to just cheat for the sake of figuring this out. Go through my services, not going to do anything. and. Bear with me. I don't know why I just wasn't able to stop that inside of ISC. I'll have to take a look at that later. Um, there. So what I wanted to show you was this next one. So um, I also support conditional breakpointing. So as you saw, I might have an issue here with, within ISE because I spend most of my time inside of ISE. But if I do, then I can chase it down. If I don't discover the issue and you discover the issue, then you can ping me. You've got my contact information, and I can chase it down. Um, so this is kind of cool because the breakpoints can be conditional. 
So I could do things like uh, run a pipeline command and stop on a particular um, instance of something going through the pipeline. So in this case, when the Windows Update Server, uh, or sorry, Windows Update Service, when it uh, is the service that's going through the pipeline, I want a breakpoint on that. And so um, that's probably the state that I'm in right now. Yeah, so dollar sign underbar is my Windows Update uh, service. So if there's a particular item that's going wrong with your pipeline or a particular condition, a null variable that happens, a certain value that's out of whack, and you want to stop and see what's going on, this lets you do that. And uh, that makes it so you can do your, break, or do your debugging and, and hit breakpoints faster. And um, another one I want to show you is when you're using conditional breakpoints, you can actually, when using any breakpoints with a breakpoint command, you can give it a message dash message. So let's say you've got something in your script that just, it's this weird issue. It shows up once in a blue moon. You don't know what's going on, but you can't put your finger on it, but it's a script that you got kicking around. And so you think, well, I'm just going to put a breakpoint here that I want to be there all the time. So that when this happens, let me know and raise a flag and put it a message like, so oh my God, it happened. And that way it can remind me, why is this breakpoint there? What's going on? And I can think, okay, I finally hit that issue. I couldn't put my finger on it. And, and then I can do my debugging and figure out what's going on rather than somebody reporting, oh, it happened again after the fact and then still not being able to reproduce the problem. So it's very handy for, for figuring that out. So um, that, that's kind of breakpoints at a high level in uh, debug PX. And now I showed you breakpointing inside of ISE where you can hit F9. There are other breakpoints you can do. You can do conditional breakpoints. Um, you just need to use the set PS breakpoint command which you can go look up help on and figure out how to do that on your own. You can also set them on specific commands that show up, and those don't show up visually in the ISC. I like the, the hand, the, the, I guess the, um, the complementary nature of visual breakpointing in ISC if I'm in ISC, as well as breakpoint by the breakpoint command because I can see what's going on, I can make them conditional, and, and they do what I expect them to do, um, aside from maybe that one issue I tripped on earlier. So that's breakpoints. Questions so far? No, good. So the last slide here, I'm going to fill in the blank a little bit. Um, I was uh, quickly typing this up, uh, some of these details this morning that I hadn't got up to yet, and so I've got some notes, so I'll, I'll work through some of this with you. Um, so defensive scripting. Um, I talked about one of these already, so try catch everything. It's a philosophy that I follow, and I mean everything. If I go into a PSM1 file that I write, I wrap that inside of a try catch block, and the catch block is simply throw. Why do I do that? Because if in my PSM1 file something throws a terminating error, that's not going to be seen as terminating according to PowerShell unless it's, unless it's inside of a try catch block. So the rest of the module PSM1 file is going to run, and the module is going to load, but I don't know what state it's going to be in. So I don't want that. If something happens and my module is going to fail, I want it to fail hard, and I don't want the module to load because it's broken. I just want the error, and then get out of there, and let me figure out what's going on. So I use try catch very liberally. Inside of my PSM1 file at the very top, I'll do open up the try and anything inside of it that I do is inside that try statement. And then at the bottom, catch throw. That's it. Just to make this happen. Yes? Kirk, when, I, when I've tried that philosophy, um, it hides the error when you just get your throw, right? And you've lost your well, throw, throw by default will rethrow the error that's caught automatically. Oh, okay. So throw with nothing on it? Yeah, so catch, yeah. catch you can do it. You're right. So it depends on how you do it. Yeah. So you can throw, and a lot of people will do throw, quote, an error happened. Don't do that. Because it's not going to help you. It's going to totally mask what actually happened. You're going to lose the context. So um, yeah. So there's a, you, can, you can catch errors by type, and you can throw specific details. But when you're dealing with just a terminating error challenge in PowerShell, just do a generic uh, catch statement with a single throw inside of it, if you want to make sure your terminating errors actually terminate and figure out what's going on from that point. But well, could you pass that hash table in, but throw on one side, with the error on one side, whatever text you wanted or something? What do you mean a hash table? Well, or, uh, or an array, if you will, one with whatever phrasing you want, and then the actual... Oh, so you can you can do that. I mean, inside of my catch statement here, I've got dollar sign underbar as a variable. So inside my catch block, when you hit catch, you get dollar sign underbar. And dollar sign underbar will be the actual error record that was received in the catch statement. And so that has properties on it. So it has one that's often on most errors, not on all of them, dot message, which is your error text. So if you want something additional, and I do that sometimes, 
I might put a, a throw statement of the um, of some prefix or something about the context of what's going on, and I will append to that string dollar sign underbar dot message, so I don't lose that context of that actual error message that was there. Yeah, that's what you were looking for. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good question. Um, also, I use try catch blocks inside of all the functions that I write. Uh, I don't use it inside of every single script block. You don't have to go to that extent. Just the generic. I have a PSM1 file, or I have a function, and inside of the top level scope of my function of my begin, um, my begin process and end blocks, I will do try catch throw, because I want terminating errors to be terminating, and it's just more reliable, that way even more predictable. Now another thing that I do in all the modules that I do, that I find a, a, a real time saver for me, let me just open up example. Uh, modules. Let's go into history px, and this is one that needs updating because that so that try catch throw thing is something I started adopting just recently inside my PSM1 files when I ran across a module that the PSM1 actually was throwing a stream in the air, but the module was still loading, and so I just started adopting that recently. So not not all of my modules have that one yet, um, but um, I do this thing at the top of every module that I write. This inside of every single PSM1 file. Invoke snippet, and this comes from a custom module I use, dash name module.initialize. So there is a module out there on my GitHub on PowerShell Get in the resources slide for this presentation called Snippet PX. Snippet PX is my solution to sometimes I have code that is the same from module to module to module to module. But it's not code to me that justifies wrapping it up in a function or that I necessarily want to wrap up in a function because by wrapping it in a function, I deal with scope. I deal with some other challenges. I don't want to change the scope. I don't want to go to a child scope. I don't want to have to remember to dot source a function uh, when, I, when I call it. I just want to basically say, take this block of code, run it right here, right now. And I want to do that on every module I write. And by doing it that way, by me externalizing those blocks, then when later on some issue comes up, I just go and modify my, that block of code, and all my modules get that for free. So every module I write these days is dependent on snippet PX, and I put this at the top, at the top of my module, and I'll show you what that snippet contains. It's pretty straightforward. So if I go into snippet PX, and if I go into my snippets folder, by the way, the way this works, snippet PX, It'll detect any snippets that are inside of a module underneath a snippet folder. And snippets are just PS1 files. So you could have some snippets particular to your own module, just create a snippets folder as a subfolder of the module folder, drop in the PS1 files, and whatever that name is, you can then invoke the snippet. So it's quite handy. Um, so module initialize, that snippet that I referred to right here, um, all it does is uh, well, it does a couple different things. There's one thing I just recently added. So it's, it sets the strict mode to the latest version or to the version that I specify. So it has a, an optional parameter if I want to specify a different strict mode. As a rule, I always use latest unless I'm doing something with WMI because there are some challenges depending on the scenario with WMI and the latest strict mode, in which case I downgrade that and I use version two. Um, but generally I always use latest because I don't get into WMI that much. And by setting strict, set strict mode, PowerShell, acts as a better watchdog for me. And it will tell me when I try to reference a property on a variable that's not initialized, rather than just saying, oh, that variable doesn't exist, it's the property, I don't care, I'm just going to go and, and not say anything. So I know a lot of people have said, don't use strict mode, it's too strict. But I, I've never looked back since, since I started using it, because it has saved me far more time than it costs for me to deal with working in strict mode. So it's a huge time saver. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a great value add in terms of just having PowerShell act as a watchdog. There's a bunch of things that it watches for. Um, you can look up help on strict mode inside of PowerShell to see what those are um, and find out if it's useful to you if you want to use a specific version of it depending on your scenario. But I use it, latest version, oh, excuse me, all the time unless I'm dealing with um, WI. Another thing I do is explicit exports because I don't like surprises. So debugging is all about, debugging and script reliability, in my opinion, is all about having less surprise. And so PowerShell, by default, will export every module that you create in a, or every function you create inside of a script module. 
but I create helper functions. I don't want those public because they're in turn they're meant for internal use. I don't document them, uh, create uh, inline help or anything like that. And so just to make it so I don't do that by accident, I use explicit exporting. I, I prefer it that way. Um, you could create your own version of this module initialize script if you think that you prefer it doing exports by default. But I just I'm very um, very very uh, diligent on forcing ex explicit exports. Um, this top one up here came from something that happened recently through uh, a conversation with June uh, on Twitter. And so, um, PS default parameter values. How many people know what that is? So it's handy. PS default parameter values is very useful because it allows you to define a default parameter value for a single command or a set of commands. And it comes up in cases like, for example, SMA. If you work with SMA, there's a connection parameter. And the connection parameter is on every command. And you don't want to sp pass in that as a parameter every single time. PS default parameter values is your friend. Very useful. Helps control the way things work in PowerShell when you need to use parameters over and over again. And so June tweeted out that when she's working with help, if I do get help on show command, and I want to show that in the window, I can do that. It's pretty cool. So I can run get help, and I get a pop-up window so I can browse through the help information rather than dealing with scrolling inside the console. Useful. Useful enough that June said, use PS default parameter values to set show command, or sorry, show window to true for get help, like this. So if I run this, now, from that point on, I'm not going to run it right now, that if I run get help without doing show window, it'll add show window for me. And so I get the usefulness of that because show, uh, PS default parameter values is useful. However, that has a cascading effect because PS default parameter values carries down into modules that you use in your environment. And because of that carry down into modules that you load and use in your environment, if any of those modules call get help and do any kind of automation around it, all of a sudden that breaks because you'll see windows popping up all over the place. And so I had a customer, a guy who uses my module, contact me after he saw June's tweet, he did this, saying, all these windows are opening up all of a sudden, what's going on? And this was the reason why. So. The solution to that is fairly straightforward. In your module, at the top of your PSM1 file, call psdefaultparameterValues.clear so that you don't inherit into the module scope. Easy enough to do, but I want to do that on every module, and I don't want to have to go through and manually update them all, and this snippet PX module allowed me to do that because I just went in and I made the change right there, and because all my modules inherit from snippet PX and invoke this module.initialize command, I was all done. So. Um, a useful tip about PS default parameter values, make sure you clear it in your modules, whether you use snippet PX or not, because you don't want other things outside of your module influencing the scope. Question? Yeah, that would be just for the uh, scripts, it'll affect scripts as well. PS default parameter values will inherit into all child scopes. So, oh, sorry, if I set this, if when I call this, yeah, when I call PS default parameter values dot clear, that clears it in my module scope. Yes, or if I do it in a script, because if you have scripts, the same thing happens, you can clear it in the script scope just so you're not influenced by what's going on outside. So that, that clear happens, yeah, because PS default parameter values is one of those um, variables that is recreated inside of every scope, and so you're clearing it in the current scope, not up one level, so you keep. So it's, it's nice, actually, because it allows you to leverage the power of PS default parameter values for your own work without worrying about am I impacting modules and stuff that I work on. Um, so I can tell I'm running out of time. I knew I had a lot of content here, and this probably could have been a good long session if I continued. Um, so that's, that's the snippet stuff that I do. Um, other defensive scripting stuff I'll talk very quickly about. Use validators and use them correctly. So when you write functions, validate, uh, use validate script uh, or validate range or validate, um, verify not null or empty. Now, all, the validators, all the validators that are available on your advanced functions, use those. Somebody asked me the other day, when do I decide between uh, validate script versus actually going inside my command and um, verifying it inside? And my rule of thumb for that is if you're looking at the content of the variable itself all by itself and not going and making calls out to the network or anything like that, for example, checking a string to see if it contains invalid parameters, that are invalid, sorry, invalid characters, then 
use a validator. If you're checking to see if the name of the cluster that the person gave you was actually a cluster, do that inside the function. Don't that, do that in the validator. Because a validator, that's not the intent. It's, it's do it inside and then throw an appropriate error message, but keep your validators about just the content of the variables without dependencies on, or the parameters, I should say, without dependencies on the parameters and whatnot to make sure that they're at least clean when they get inside of you. And the other thing I really wanted to mention here um, is uh, when you're comparing arrays, be careful about left-hand side versus right-hand side. So for example, there is a difference between, um, let's say that x is an array, even if it's an empty one, there is a difference between uh, converting that to a Boolean, um, and then dollar sign x equals null, versus converting that to a Boolean, and then dollar sign null equals x. There is a big difference between those two. The first one looks at every value in x, checks and sees, are any of those null? If so, pass them through. So you get a subarray, a new array, So, and that's not the same context. The second one says, I want to check and see if x is actually equal to null. So whenever you're working with collections, value on the left-hand side, correct collection on the right-hand side, unless your intent is to actually filter or modify that collection and create a subcollection and do some stuff. General rule, um, saves a lot of time and saves a lot of errors by following that because sometimes you might have a collection that only has one value and, and it just works, but then later on you get multiple values and things break and you're like, why? Well, maybe it's because you didn't put things on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side correctly. And that's all I'm going to cover. So I'm going to hit the red button here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Let me switch back to my slide deck, which I always forget to do. And uh, there. So that's my contact information if you have more questions. And uh, thanks. And please let me know in the comments how this is. This is the first time I've delivered this particular content to people. So I'd love feedback on whether it was, us whether it was useful, whether it wasn't. If there were expectations you had that I didn't meet, let me know those. And I can improve the content later on going forward. Thanks.